Good morning, everyone. I would like to introduce Christy Reichert, Medicaid Waiver Specialist and Supervisor with the Area Agency on Aging of Pasco Pinellas, presenting on State Medicaid Managed Care Long-Term Care. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Hello, family, good morning. I should say. Hello. Um, I'm calling you all family because whether you're experiencing ALS yourself or helping someone who is, we are all part of the same family now. So in that spirit today, I will explain the statewide Medicaid managed care program as if I was helping my own family member. In this picture is me and my 96 year old grandma, Grandma Agnes. She was a librarian for 30 years and she still reads every day in her assisted living facility. A little background on me, I've worked in with the Area Agency on Aging of Pasco Pinellas for 12 years. Specifically, I've worked with this program since its very beginning in 2014. The Area Agency on Aging of Pasco Pinellas is one of 11 Aging and Disability Resource Centers in Florida, also known as an ADRC. We all have one phone number, so no matter what county you're in in Florida, you can call the number that's at the bottom of the, each slide, and it will direct you to your local office. Today, you'll discover what the Medicaid Managed Care, I'm sorry, Statewide Medicaid Managed Care Long-Term Program is, what it can do for you, and how you go about getting it. In addition, I've included additional programs and services that your local Aging and Disability Resource Center can provide. The name of this program is very long, so to make it easier for everyone to understand, from here on out, I will refer to the program as Medicaid Long-Term Care. Kind of in the biz, that's what we shorten it to. It is important to know that there are over 50 different types of Medicaid. I will not be explaining all these other types today, only the long-term care and other programs that specifically provide in-home help. Medicaid long-term care is a multi-departmental program. That means that the Agency for Healthcare Administration, Department of Child and Family Services, as well as Department of Elder Affairs, all manage and coordinate parts of how this program operates. Let's start by talking about what it is. This program is part of part federally funded and part state funded. It's a special Medicaid program. Its original design is to keep people safely in their homes and avoid nursing home placement. It is considered a Medicaid waiver program. Now, a lot of people ask me why it's called a waiver, and it's because at the very basic level, this program is waiving institutional care in favor of care at home, which is pretty neat. Every state has a Medicaid waiver program like this, but they're all vastly different in services and eligibility criteria. Many people who call us uh, know somebody in another state, maybe New York, and they want the same services. However, Florida designed their own Medicaid waiver and are not required to provide the same exact things as other states do. It is important to understand that this program has a waiting list. This, it is one of the only types of Medicaid that has a waiting list. Medicaid long-term care is for individuals who are either disabled or over the age of 65. Department of Elder Affairs reviews each case to determine if they meet level of care. This means that they would need the meet the medical ne ne the, sorry medical necessity standards to prevent nursing home placement. And Department of Children and Families determines if you meet the financial criteria. Okay, but at this point, you're probably wondering, well, what exactly am I going to get? On this slide, you'll see the list of services that are offered through the program. No one receives every service on this list. It is based on the care that you need at the time. For example, somebody who may be recovering for a major surgery may only receive home delivered meals, personal care, help with bathing or housekeeping, 
but another individual who perhaps has dementia may receive adult daycare or assisted living facility care. It really depends on what the care is, what the care need is at the time. Service, services provided at home typically do not offer 24 hour or overnight care. That is important to know. Services do need to be medically necessary at the time they are ordered for you. It's common experience that people will get a few hours per week of in-home care and then see how that goes before they order any additional hours. Now, how do you get it? Step one is to call us. Call that 800-96-ELDER number, and that's the very first step. We will complete an assessment over the phone. This assessment is a standardized format with mostly multiple choice questions. It's called an intake assessment or a 701S assessment. We will ask for your social security number, income, and assets. I'll talk more about the financial side in a little bit. The most important questions on this assessment has to do with the activities of daily living. For example, how much help do you need to bathe? You will be given options ranging from no help is needed to total help is needed. All you need to do is select the one option that best fits you. I'll tell you a quick story. My mom is a home care nurse. She goes to see people who do wound care and other things like that. I had called somebody one day to complete an assessment at the same time my mom happened to be at this lady's house. She could hear my voice through the phone. I had no idea my mom was there. But she called me later and she said, Christy, that lady lied to you. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean she lied to me? She said, well, you asked her how much help she needs with bathing and she said she didn't need any. And my mom said she knew from being right there with her that the individual had not bathed in weeks. And that was a really big lesson for me to ask more follow-up questions because people do minimize their needs. So on this assessment, we really need to know what it is you need help with. In addition, the assessment will ask for your medical conditions and information about your caregiver if you have one. We will ask questions to your care caregiver about the strain it is on them. The biggest mistake people make in this caregiver section is caregivers fr frequently do not want to admit that they're struggling or they may not be able to continue. For example, I had a son once tell me he was gonna drop his mom off at the police station because he just couldn't take it anymore. But after a while, I was able to calm him down. And when I asked him how much strain it was on him to provide care for her, he answered none, no strain at all. I've given a lot of thought about why caregivers are so resistant to admitting how hard it is. And I think it may just be that they love the person and admitting that it's hard feels like betrayal. But on our assessment, we really need to know if it's a strain because caregiver burnout is real. All right, next, how do you qualify? There's three basic criteria. First, you must be released from the waiting list. Second, the Department of Elder Affairs must determine if you meet the medical criteria of being medically necessary. They will ask you to complete a medical form number 3008 that your doctor must fill out. And third, the Department of Children and Families, AKA the Medicaid office, must determine that you meet the financial criteria. The financial limits are set by the federal poverty levels. Currently, Medicaid long-term care has the highest allowable income limit at $2,382 per month gross income. That's the total amount you receive from all income, whether that be social security, pensions, work income, unemployment, anything that you receive on a regular basis. There is also an asset limit. Assets are things like your checking account, savings accounts, stocks, bonds, IRAs, or anything that you have money in that you're not getting a disbursement from. Now, when you're a married couple, the one of you who is not applying for Medicaid long-term care 
can keep up to $123,000 in liquid assets in their own name. Otherwise, the asset limit is $2,000 plus your monthly income. Let me give you an example. So if you, your Social Security check was $1,000, and the, then the asset limit for you would be $3,000, that's because it's $2,000 plus your monthly income. And yes, Medicaid will deny your case if you have even $1 more than the income or asset limit allows. But never fear, there are ways around this. Hopefully you guys can see this slide, it's a little light on my side. An elder law attorney can review your legal options to help you become eligible. Now it wouldn't be my place to tell you what those legal options are as I'm not an attorney. However, I will tell you from experience that most elder law attorneys will offer a free consultation and tell you what your options are right then. We do suggest talking to the right professional if you are over the income or asset limits. One of the things I hear a lot from people over the phone is, is Medicaid going to take my money? No, it's not. Medicaid doesn't have a copay. And they will not withdraw your assets until you're below the asset limit. Medicaid will simply approve or deny your application. This Medicaid program is very similar to long-term care insurance products that are out there. It's an additional type of insurance coverage that most people don't have. It's coverage for in-home care outside of what your health insurance would provide. Medicaid long-term care does not change or alter anything about your current insurance. If you do not have any other insurance, though, it will provide Medicaid insurance coverage. But Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Next, I do want to bring your attention to the fact that your home and one vehicle are excluded in the asset total. Most people are worried that their home is going to disqualify them. And that's just not an accurate assumption, unless you have more than one home. Next, I'm gonna go over some do's and don'ts of applying for Medicaid long-term care. Number one, do be prepared to wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> this program does have a waiting list. That mean, means you may be waiting days, weeks, or months. The assessor that places people on the waiting list is not going to know how long you will wait. Individuals are released by the Agency for Healthcare Administration and Department of Elder Affairs, not your local office. They won't know who is going to be released until we get a list of names, and then we do reach out as soon as we can. Number two, please do not omit information. I can tell you many people choose not to tell us their income or their asset information or their social security number. It is voluntary. However, it makes it really hard on the assessor to determine if there are any other programs or resources that may be appropriate for you. We don't wanna give you a number for a program or a resource if we don't know for sure that it's gonna help you. So if you give us your information, we can help you a lot better. Number three, elder law attorneys have made people's dreams come true when they have income or asset uh, issues. Please let them be your guide. No one who was un unqualified in that way should be giving you any advice on how to become Medicaid eligible unless they are an elder law attorney. Next, don't apply for Medicaid long-term care on the DCF or Access Florida website without first calling us and completing an assessment. This is only gonna cause you frustration. DCF cannot approve your case without you being released from the waiting list. And if you're not even on the waiting list, DCF will just deny your case and tell you to call us. The application process itself takes between 30 and 90 days. And a lot of that depends on you. There is information that will be requested from you and if you don't provide it, your case is just gonna be denied. The most common issue we have is that Department of Children and Families will send what they call a notice of case action, and the individual 
just tosses it away. It is important to understand that Medicaid long-term care is not the only program out there. There are other types of government funded in-home assistance. On this slide, you'll see some of the other programs that the ADRC will review when they complete the assessment with you. All of these programs on this slide are for people over the age of 60. For example, Meals on Wheels, we get calls about that every single day. It's probably one of the most commonly requested programs. This particular program is not Medicaid. It has no income or asset limitation, just an age limit. Each county keeps their own waiting list for these programs. Sometimes these programs have a waiting list. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we can direct you to a conjugate meal site near you where you can go in and get a free meal every day. If you do appear eligible for any of these programs, the assessor will place you on those waiting lists automatically. You don't have to memorize the slide or ask for them specifically. And I say that with the exception of elder abuse prevention. If you feel like you may be suffering from a situation like this, we do encourage you to tell your assessor so that we can help. Next slide is gonna show you government funded programs for any age. For these, you do have to be either disabled or over the age of 60, either one. These three programs are the primary alternatives to Medicaid long-term care and the type of in-home services provided. They also have a small copay that is based on household income. They will tell you the amount of your copay if you are released for, from the waiting list for any of these. CE and CCDA both provide in-home care such as personal care, housekeeping, incontinence supplies, and respite care, while HCE and HCDA primarily provide the caregiver stipend of $160 a month. Lastly, Alzheimer's Disease Initiative provides mostly respite care for people with memory disorders like Alzheimer's or dementia, but it can be any age as long as there's that diagnosis and a full-time caregiver in the home. We are noticing an increase of people uh, with these memory diagnoses at earlier and earlier ages. Lastly, there are other community-based supports to consider. Many home health companies and agencies that are out there, you can simply call them and hire them to come and take care of your needs. They will tell you how much they charge by the hour and you can set up the type of care and how much you want. The big benefit of private pay is that you have a lot more control over the workers who come into your home. You have a lot more power to interview people and keep the same workers coming in. Next, hospice is free and it can be ordered by your doctor if you meet the criteria. And we also have a surprising amount of people who call us after they were on hospice because they've recovered. So it does happen. Next, don't discount local support. Churches, community centers, they all may have volunteers that may be able to provide a little respite care or shopping assistance. The VA has a wonderful program for veterans. It's called Aid and Attendance. If you're a veteran or you're married to a veteran who served during a declared wartime, you may be eligible. Aid and Attendance is a cash benefit even if you never got any VA income before you became disabled. So I highly recommend contacting your local Veterans Association to see if that may be an option for you. Finally, there are five counties in Florida that have a PACE program. PACE is the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly. The basic requirements are that you're over the age of 55 and live in that county. It is a Medicare Medicaid partnership program that can also provide in-home care like meals, transportation, housekeeping, or personal care 
keep you more comfortable in your home for as long as possible. Now, that concludes my presentation. We have about a little less than 10 minutes left. I did want to save some time to answer any questions that were in the chat. I do encourage you all to write down our phone number. What I tell my own family is that it's better to be assessed and placed on the waiting list than to do nothing at all. After all, you have to be on the waiting list, get off the waiting list. My heart does go out to each of you and I hope my presentation has helped some of you understand what is out there. I'm going to go ahead and look in the chat and answer any questions that pop up in there. I do see the first question, what is the total income allowed for married couples? So we, we do get this question a lot. And the answer is really not very cut and dry because it depends on if only one in the couple is applying or if both of them need long-term care. So if both of them are applying for long-term care, it is the monthly income limit times two. If only one person is applying and the other is not, then their income is discounted. It's not, uh, you have to report it, but it's not counted against you. Is there any other questions that anybody else has? No one has questions? Oh, here's a good one. Can I have both hospice and long-term care at the same time period? So technically you can be on hospice and long-term care at the same time as far as being enrolled in those programs, but you cannot receive the service at the same time. So, for example, if you had a hospice nurse coming over, you couldn't at that same time have a CNA come over under long-term care. That's a duplication of services. Anything else? I'll give it just one more minute. All right, then I have a couple of links here for you to look at. The main one is our phone number that, like I said earlier, that 1-800 number is going to direct you to your local ADRC in order to initiate the process. Next, the Florida Ombudsman is a great resource for people who are long-term care residents and are suffering from some sort of issue with that facility. They're volunteers, so they'll actually go out to the individual uh, facility and resolve the issues face-to-face, uh, -face, which is really nice. Well, in normal times, non-COVID times. And next, there's SHINE. SHINE is the Volunteer Health Insurance Counseling that is also available through our agency, the ADRC. Um, they will provide unbiased advice and counseling regarding your Medicare and health insurance choices. They are some of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met in my life. They're retired uh, professionals who now volunteer their time to do SHINE assistance. Uh, next, I have legal assistance for elders or caregivers or advocates. So they're really great with answering questions if you need how legal housing assistance, uh, if you need power of power of attorney, healthcare surrogate. They're really good at that stuff. And usually the legal assistance is free of charge, but there is some financial limitations there. Uh, next, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, their website is here. They have some really great information if you're interested in research. <laughs> they have a whole flow chart of how this whole process works. It's all color coded. Um, they're also the place that you would enter in any grievances or complaints if you are currently on the program and something's not working well for you. 
um, that that's the website you would go to to get assistance with that. And lastly is choice counseling. So once you are enrolled in any of the Medicaid managed care plans, if you want to get advice or change your plan, you are able to do so online. So that's the website that you would go. Uh, that website also has some really interesting information about what's available in each county because it really varies. I see a question in here about is there a way to expedite? There really is not a way to expedite, and we do get that question a lot. Um, the waiting list is really based on your answers on the assessment, and we're just as in the dark as you are as far as when is that person going to reach the top of the waiting list. We do encourage people to talk to the doctor to see if their health insurance can provide in-home help while this is processing. The waiting list is prioritized to the neediest and frailest in the state. That said, it's kind of an algorithm. So it's the assessor or your local office is not going to have any way to expedite. I would say, though, we are always trying to expedite every case that we work with. Questions about PACE? Yes, I'm not sure which other counties, Pinellas County does have a PACE. Um, that's the county that we're based off of. Pasco County does not have a PACE. Um, but PACE is always looking at expanding, so there could actually be more than the five uh, in the near future. All right. Well, with that, I, I wish you all a great day. Thank you so much for listening. Um, happy to come and present for you today. Please give us a call if we can help. Guys, have a great day and take care. Bye-bye.